welcome everybody to our next very exciting discussion in our virtual lecture series at Fulbright Ukraine. Um, today's discussion uh, is brought to you by experts in history and also present day um, uh, issues around nuclear security and the functioning of nuclear power plants um, with specialization in Ukraine could not be a more timely topic. And the title of the panel is International Security in the Nuclear Age. Just so everyone knows, this is being recorded and we will post it to our official YouTube channel so you can reference it after the talk, share it with your students, uh, retweet it or repost, whatever you, de you decide. Um, if you would like to put any questions in the chat while the presenters are speaking, you're absolutely welcome to do so. Uh, we will save the majority of our Q&A for the end of the discussion. Uh, save for questions for Paulina Sinovets because she will not be able to be with us at the very end of our panel presentation. So if you have uh, questions after the first portion of our presentations today, after Dr. Paulina Sinovets uh, presents, please put them in the chat and we will make sure that we respond to those questions as well. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our speakers in the order of their presentations today. Our first speaker, as I mentioned, will be Paulina Sinovets. Um, she was a Fulbright visiting scholar in 2017-2018, and she is from the Odessa Center for Nonproliferation in Odessa, Ukraine, Foundation for Strategic Research in Paris, France, and she will be speaking on the war on Ukraine and the chances of Russia's use of nuclear weapons, consequences for international security. After Dr. Sinovets, uh, Dr. Simon Miles will speak. He is a professor at Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. And he will talk about eight months later, lessons from Ukraine on modern warfare. And then Dr. Olena Paranyuk will present. She was a Fulbright Visiting Scholar 2023 to 2024. And she is at the Institute for Safety Problems, or sorry, she is a Fulbright Scholar, is what I mean to say. Um, she is with Institute for Safety Problems of Nuclear Power Plants at the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And she will be speaking on future of radiation safety, what we should consider in the world and where nuclear terrorism has become possible today. Um, there are more extensive bibliographies uh, listing publications and achievements and fellowships of all of our speakers posted on our announcement and also will be um, posted alongside our YouTube recording. So please do revisit um, their backgrounds to engage with them, invite them to your institutions as speakers and potentially co-write, co-publish, um, et cetera, et cetera. We, we are always encouraging at Fulbright um, ongoing facilitation and um, connections between our communities on um, all sides of the ocean, not just of the Atlantic, but all oceans. So let's um, begin with Dr. Sinovets. Um, okay. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, um, here is my presentation. I hope you see it. Yeah. Okay, so um, of course, um, this topic is very much uh, already very much exploited, already very much debated, and it is one of the hottest topics uh, currently, unfortunately, because um, during um, these months of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, it has become obvious that nuclear weapons are not the outdated um, element of uh, politics, but uh, it can become even the element of the warfare, uh, which uh, looked very strange and very even outrageous for the current nuclear order. So uh, starting from, okay, okay, sorry my uh, second slide. So speaking about um, the possibility of using nuclear weapons uh, during the uh, war on Ukraine, I would like to attract your attention to five speeches of President Putin, which he made during uh, this war. So the first speech is the February 24th, when he declared so-called special operation against Ukraine, saying that 
uh, whoever interfering uh, would uh, face the unprecedented consequences, which was a direct hint over the using of nuclear weapons, the possibility of using of nuclear weapons. Again, um, later, three days later, when uh, Ukraine started to ask for the no-fly zone from the West, um, Russia declared that it has put its nuclear deterrence forces of, on high alert, meaning to curse the West from uh, providing Ukraine of the tools and means and weapons for the no-fly zone. And, it, uh, and this hints really worked because no one did that. Again, now one of the important speeches is the one from the May 30th, when um, Putin warned the West not to provide Ukraine with the long-range weapons, long-range missiles, um, the ones which are able to hit the territory of Ukraine, uh, threatening that uh, there can be a threat of the escalation of this war. And uh, uh, still, there, are, um, there is a certain contrast between those speeches and the uh, two latest ones, uh, which Putin um, proclaimed in uh, September. The first one was September 21, when Putin um, declared uh, about the necessity to, um, the fact that Russia would uh, annex Ukraine regions and uh, that Russia would use all means to protect uh, Russian territory hinting over nuclear weapons. And September 30th, he actually declared the result of the referendums um, to annex uh, Ukraine territories and also reminded uh, the world the example of Hiroshima um, the only case when uh, the nuclear weapons were used, which was highly interpreted as the determination of Putin to um, show his eagerness to um, use nuclear weapons uh, in this war. So um, on my point of view, the speech on September 30th was also very important because by this speech, Putin so-called closed the door for himself uh, to exit the situation peacefully to act the situation without the victory in his on his terms, he understands it. And this is a very concerning sign because um, this is the sign of the one who is uh, trapped in the himself in the corner and he doesn't see any way out except the that radical way which he uh, preferred. However, to understand whether it's possible, whether Russia is going to do this, uh, we should probably look a little bit at the Russian ma uh, main uh, military provision uh, and documents, which gives the understanding of uh, when and how Russia is going to use um, nuclear weapons. So um, uh, without uh, you know, over overburdening your attention, I would attract uh, um, your um, look uh, probably to the military doctrine of 2000, uh, where Russia proclaimed uh, that uh, it's going to use nuclear weapons under critical circumstances when conventional means prove their inefficiency. Why this doctrine is so important? Because on my point of view, the, follow, uh, the followed doctrines of 2010 and 2014 um, sort of uh, continuation and the main provisions of the doctrine 2000, they're embedded in the whole idea of the following uh, doctrines. According to this uh, doctrine of 2000, uh, Russia was uh, proclaiming to its eagerness to use um, nuclear weapons in the regional war. So in the war of Russia and its neighbor, when uh, some third party interferes, and uh, the main aim of using nuclear weapons is the escalation of the military actions on terms favorable to Russia Federation, which is again, a little bit reminding the current situation. So um, also, uh, we have current doctrine uh, of uh, 2014, uh, when um, nuclear weapons used is uh, prescribed to the situation if the state's existence is in jeopardy, which is a very vague term, and uh, whatever can be uh, subscribed to this term. Um, however, um, I would say that to understand Russian nuclear terms better, we should look at the latest document, which is nuclear deterrence fundamentals, uh, or the basics of uh, Russian nuclear deterrence, uh, the last document which uh, explains, so the basic principles of state policy of the Russian Federation on nuclear deterrence from the 2020, which explains um, the basic provision of Russian nuclear deterrence. So um, what is the main uh, for me here is that um, the main idea, the main goal of nuclear deterrence is defending the state uh, and its territorial integrity. 
Uh, and now, after September 30th, it turns out that territorial integrity, um, I mean, from the standpoint of law, Russian law, um, the current um, Russian territory includes those annexed regions of Ukraine. And therefore, any attempts of Ukrainian military forces to try to get it back can be interpreted as uh, the attempt for the territorial integrity of Russia. Again, um, nuclear weapons use is prescribed in case of attack by adversary against critical military sites, the disruption of which will undermine nuclear forces response actions. We all know about Russian um, strategic, not Russian strategic, but Russian fleet carrying nuclear weapons in Crimea. So any serious attack of even Ukraine uh, counteroffense forces uh, over um, Crimea and Russian fleet can be again interpreted from this standpoint of view. And also, there is a reliable information on the missile launch from the rival state, but um, it uh, is much closer to the European uh, issues and the possibility to de uh, deploy um, missiles of the medium range in Europe. So, and it also can be a reason for starting the deliberate nuclear war, but mostly now we are speaking about the uh, nuclear war um, starting because of the Russia's will. So uh, we should answer basically these questions. Under what circumstances uh, can Russia use nuclear weapons, um, scenarios of use, and the implications for the European security, of course, uh, and the world security, I would say. Um, so the circumstances. Um, Again, we were talking about the Ukrainian counteroffense, the possibility of uh, uh, using nuclear weapons against Ukrainian forces, and against the information about the launch of missile, which is from the West, uh, I would say, but this one is not that um, highly possible now, because uh, I still believe that Russian early warning systems and the, the red, uh, the hotline, the whole telephone line between uh, states leaders is uh, pretty reliable at the moment. So I suggest you to go to scenarios, directly to go to scenarios. And um, so we are trying to go to scenarios, but we are not really... Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so basically there are three uh, scenarios. Uh, which is not defined by me, but many, many experts. It's like it's the sum of all fears, I would say. Um, using nuclear weapons against Ukraine, how can it be done? Uh, first and the last uh, threatening, and the least threatening scenario is uh, the possibility of nuclear weapons test of the Black Sea, or even the nuclear weapons test in the Nova Zimla to show um, the United States and NATO that Russia is eager to use nuclear weapons and that it's not going to stick to any kind of uh, former provisions of the world order, former treaties or whatsoever. So it will be the preliminary step, still not using nuclear weapons, but already something close to that. However, I don't think that Russia would go uh, doing it because uh, that would make the West even much more ready to respond to Russia. And it can involve at some point the preemptive uh, military operation against Russian forces, potentially involved in um, nuclear strike over Ukraine, I mean, future nuclear actions against Ukraine. Again, um, there were a lot of exploitations about whether Russia can use um, the uh, weapons, nuclear weapons at the battlefield. And on my uh, point of view, the probability of use is very low. Because using one uh, low yield nuclear um, bomb at the battlefield would not stop Ukraine counteroffensive actions, while using uh, nuclear weapons along the whole border between Russia and Ukraine, where Ukrainian forces are concentrated, would be deadly not only to Ukraine, but also to Russian territories because of their potential contamination and the Russian population living there. So actually Russia would create much more mess and much more damage to its own territory and its own population at the European territory. Um, so, and it won't probably uh, stop the Ukrainian counteroffense. At least it would. It can. It can create certain changes even within Russia because of these actions. So it's pretty threatening for the Russian regime as well. And the last scenario, which I consider much more uh, plausible. And which was, by the way, reminded, um, like mentioned, 
by President Putin with a recent conversation with President Macron, the, when they were discussing against this nuclear topic, and when uh, Putin said that, uh, by the way, um, uh, you should not use uh, nuclear bomb against the major cities such as, uh, you know, capital, which shows, which is shown by the U.S. example of using nuclear weapons against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There can be some small secondary cities, not really important, but at the end, the use of nuclear weapons against Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed the U.S. determination and led them to victory. So it it also had become sort of the indirect evidence of the fact that Russia may. Uh, think over um, using nuclear weapons against some small city in Ukraine or playing on the nerves of the West, uh, which is also very possible because um, I still believe that um, nuclear weapons is not the weapons of war and that Putin knows that it's not the weapons of war, but it's a, it's a weapons of the very strong political pressure and very strong political influence. So uh, by using this so-called nuclear card, Putin just trying to keep the West tense, trying to let them know that whatever you do, it may end up with the uh, very catastrophic and deadly circumstances for you, uh, even nuclear weapons use. Uh, so I still think that this is a blackmail because um, we know that uh, in the recent use, there were um, the information uh, that um, uh, Russian uh, general staff, Russian generals, they were discussing the possibility of using tactical nuclear weapons against Ukraine. After that, there was a very, um, you know, big scandal around that. And Russian military minister of defense last week, they published again the main provisions and main conditions of uh, when Russia is uh, going to use nuclear weapons. And there was again the state uh, existence under the jeopardy and the attack on the Russian territory with uh, conventional weapons. Uh, while uh, Russians are not able really to um, uh, resist anyhow. So in the critical, really critical circumstances, uh, giving a hint, a very strong hint that they are not going to use nuclear weapons. Still, Putin is playing on this card and I think that he is enjoying that feeling of superiority and that feeling of fear he can produce over the West. And first of all, over the um, Europe, uh, which he considers quite weak and um, not determined to defend Ukraine and even its own interest, I think. Uh, at the same time, I would like to emphasize the growing involvement of the United States in this situation, uh, which is pretty interesting because it was the evolution of the United States being deterred by Russian threats since the 24th of February, when uh, President Biden before announced that the main aim for the United States is not to admit the beginning of the Third World War with nuclear weapons, up to the very strong deterrent position, which uh, appeared uh, already this autumn in September. Why? Because in September, um, Putin showed uh, the very strong credibility um, of uh, Russian nuclear intentions that <clears throat> So the possibility of using nuclear weapons against Ukraine, they became quite plausible. And um, it pushed uh, the United States for the very simple understanding that now it's not only Ukraine, which is at stake, because Ukraine is not the member of NATO. The United States should not deter Russia from uh, doing anything with Ukraine. However, if... Uh, we speak not about Ukraine, but about the global nuclear order, which is based on non-use of nuclear weapons, and it is based on non-use of nuclear weapons. Any use of nuclear weapons, if it brings uh, the user a certain success, if Russia, we would say, it, it would be catastrophic for the current nuclear order. If Russia would pave the way for having Ukraine, for absorbing Ukraine by using nuclear weapons, then Russia would regard the same possibility towards Georgia, Moldova, and then if being successful towards um, the Baltic states, no matter they are the members of NATO, if NATO would permit doing these things with Ukraine and others. Uh, also, Russia is not alone because we have Iran cherishing nuclear plans for a long time, and uh, no matter how much they reject it, they are the threshold nuclear state, state and at some point, they're always regarding that possibility. 
to have nuclear weapons. So if Russia would be a positive example regarding reaching the aims via nuclear weapons use or nuclear weapons uh, use threats, then Iran may follow this path. And then all um, US vital interest in the Persian Gulf will be at stake. Again, North Korea, they are already a nuclear state and they also may regard doing something making some actions against South Korea, or absorbing South Korea, seeing that the United States are not doing anything. So uh, the potential uh, nuclear weapons use can break the current nuclear order and the United St States are the main guardians and, um, and among the main guardians of this order. Um, this is why I, I consider that um, since September, we all know that the United States are, um, is waging a serious dialogue with Russia and um, which is full of uh, certain deterrent signals and that Jake Sullivan, Sullivan is doing that um, and not only him. Uh, and uh, so I consider that those um, actions turn to be pretty much successful because no matter <clears throat> of how much uh, Putin would use uh, this nuclear rhetoric, um, the official grade of um, nuclear threats, it, uh, I would say it became lower. However, of course, it's not uh, zero at the moment. And this is, uh, of course, this is a quite a concerning sign. So uh, coming uh, to the conclusions, I would say that now we are um, in the situation when the real threat of uh, the nuclear weapons use is pretty high, at least at the same level uh, as it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I mean, here I will repeat President Biden, and I, I don't think that he's mistaken. And this is situation is uh, maybe not that accurate. However, uh, it's much more prolonged and it can develop in a very critical way. Um, nuclear taboo has always been one of the main pillars of the current nuclear order since the Second World War and the end of the Second World War. And uh, of course, any new, any breach of um, nuclear taboo or non-use of nuclear weapons would shake this order and would uh, collapse this order significantly. And this is why uh, the key, such key actors of uh, the world nuclear order, such pillars of um, world nuclear order as the United States, um, they started to act um, actively practicing deterrence against Russia while before um, that situation, uh, Russia was mostly deterring the West from supplying of certain types of weapons, from providing of no-fly zo zone, from doing certain steps, and of course, from the active interference. Um, however, I believe that the US deterrence threat gave Russia a certain understanding that the potential use of nuclear weapons would involve the United States, uh, not only politically, but also militarily. Uh, which would again put Russia on the verge, on the serious verge of the Third World War, where the nuclear escalation is possible. And I don't think that this nuclear war, world nuclear war, is in the plans of President Putin. This is why I consider that no matter that um, today we can say about certain growing of uh, nuclear danger um, related The war in Ukraine and in particular, this thing is not only uh, practiced by Russia, but it also works uh, towards Russia. And um, that at the end, it would bring us some benefits of the longer peace after. Thank you very much. This is the end. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sinovets, for uh, your presentation. And I would like to open the floor to audience members who might have questions or comments for Dr. Sinovets. Again, we will have more time at the end of all of our presentations for questions, but I just wanna um, give anybody a chance to raise their hand. Um, Olena, Dr. Paranyuk. Uh, hi, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And I would say it was really reassuring. Uh, I have a little question about the future. Uh, well, 
the present situation became possible because of the present world order and where we have nuclear countries and non-nuclear countries and where the tension was growing for 60 years uh, when non-nuclear countries uh, felt uh, that it is um, not fair actually to have the technology and not to have a nuclear weapon. What do you think uh, after the end of this war uh, should the world order should be reconsidered somehow and uh, to make the, those rules uh, even for all of the countries? Um, thank you very much uh, for your question, Dr. Elena. It's a very complicated issue because um, there is a, one very grave truth that um, there is no equality, equality in this world. And um, the best possible world is based on the consensus that some there are still some rich and some poor. So uh, the current world order is based on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which admits the existence of nuclear states and non-nuclear states. Moreover, a lot of non-nuclear states are benefiting from nuclear deterrence provided by nuclear states as NATO, Japan, South Korea, uh, from benefiting from the US nuclear deterrence. <clears throat> And uh, some, for some states, it's um, the matter of um, defending the interests. For some states, it's a matter of prestige, like for Russia, and also defending the interests, because now we can see that nuclear weapons uh, can have a function of umbrelling uh, your offensive actions against your neighbors. And so you can do whatever against your neighbors and no one will punish you. Actually, what Russia is doing, um, that is why... Um, at the same time, now we see that the organization of the Treaty of on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, they raised, they started to work actively, and more and more states condemn nuclear weapons. So I have a my biggest fear is that in this situation, some states would definitely see the um, advantage of having nuclear weapons, and some states would definitely see the um, non egalitarian, yes, the egalitarian character of uh, the world order, and they would demand to destroy all nuclear weapons. At the end, nuclear, uh, the NPT, which is uh, the golden um, something in between, like the golden, golden compromise, it will be collapsed because of those marginal um, tendencies, of those tendencies uh, away from this um, golden compromise. And at the end, uh, I would bet that we would not face non-nuclear world because nuclear world is the highest symbol of power and uh, probably the humanity is still not ready to deny it. And in the end, uh, we will face just the nuclear anarchy where other, nobody will have the same common law like the NPT. And this is the gravest possibility. So I think that this... Um, this is a big problem, but uh, but also this is the biggest um, aim for the future generation to preserve the NPT, to avoid this nuclear chaos and nuclear anarchy in the world. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sinovets, for this um, very, very timely and important work that you do. Now we will hear from Dr. Olena Paranyu. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of my ideas. I won't have any presentation. I will just talk a little bit. Uh, so uh, my the, the topic of my presentation is what we should do in the board world whether nuclear terrorism is possible. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I've been uh, to a big congress in Portugal. Uh, it was the European Radiation Protection Week. So mostly uh, all of the uh, representatives of the institutions who are involved um, in talking about the radiation protection were present presented there. And um, we, after the discussions, uh, we ended up uh, with a statement that uh, we, Russia is using the nuclear weapons already uh, because it is using the nu nuclear weapons for terrorism. Because basically, 
Russia is threatening not only Ukraine, but the whole world. And uh, it is very difficult to not to, uh, it is very difficult not to mention, and actually it is very difficult to act in the situation where you should consider uh, the possibility of using the nuclear weapon against you and against uh, the, whole, uh, the whole world, I would say. Uh, so basically, uh, I wanted uh, to complement a little bit the presentation of Dr. Polina because uh, from the point of view of the radiation safety, uh, we are pretty much sure that we will have to uh, reshape the radiation safety as it is. Uh, I need you. I, I need to give you a short little insight about what nuclear terrorism is. What what is was what what was it considered to be uh, before the present war? So the nuclear terrorism uh, was some act of aggression, uh, where some marginal people uh, they might be terrorists or just some uh, crazy guys they were just stealing um, some nuclear nuclear material which might be uh, the source the medical source or the technological source. Uh, and they were treating in population with uh, using with just you know opening the source and contaminating uh, the territory. Uh, also, the act of nuclear terrorism was considered to be uh, that people would actually uh, intrude to some nuclear facility, such as nuclear power plant, or again, uh, medical hospital, which is using some nuclear technology. So they might intrude there uh, and they might use uh, the um, sources for the sake of something they want actually to, to, to get. Um, all in all, all of the nuclear terrorism um, was considered to be as a tool uh, for blackmailing uh, people who are in charge uh, and treating them that in case uh, the terrorists won't get uh, something they want, they, they might be able actually to use um, this radionuclide, radionuclide source. Right now, uh, the idea of what nuclear terrorism uh, is drastically changed uh, and the Radiation Protection Society isn't clear yet. So it is, uh, it is discussed in couloirs uh, that Russia is a nuclear terrorist already as it is treating in uh, all of the population, but we don't have the exact definition. Uh, anyway, uh, one of the points of this terrorism is actually treating in people and making people consider what would they do in case of the nuclear war. Um, I've been doing quite a lot of lecturing during these eight months, uh, and it was very unexpected for me because I'm a radiation biologist. Uh, I became a radiation biologist back in 2008, when I started my master thesis about uh, some radionuclide migration in the environment. And uh, I'm reminding you that it was before the Fukushima accident. Uh, it was after the Chernobyl accident. And after the, it was like almost 25 years after the Chernobyl accident. And everyone in the world uh, were sure uh, that it was the only one nuclear catastrophe, nuclear accident of such a huge range. Uh, and now, uh, as we adopted the new rules of radiation safety after Chernobyl, right now we are safe. So we actually, we are good with all of the radiation protection measures and we don't have to do anything. Uh, then Fukushima happened and uh, uh, I found myself in a situation where my skills and my knowledge was necessary uh, for uh, Japanese government and for Japanese people. Uh, of course, Japan has a lot of expertise um, in taking care of the radionuclide contamination delivered to them by Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, yet, they needed some experience from Ukrainians and Belarusians and Russians uh, about how to deal uh, with the large-scale contamination of the territory and what should what should they do with that? Uh, it was a very technical expertise and it was quite narrow. So anyway, uh, some of my skills were pretty useful and interesting for people. And right now, during the full-scale war, 
Uh, I'm given a lot of interviews to mass media and also a lot of public lectures just to normal people. And we are talking what should we do in case uh, if the nuclear bomb will be detonated and how should we prepare ourselves, uh, what kind of nuclear suitcase should we collect, how should we seal uh, our apartment uh, to protect ourselves from uh, radio and nuclear fallout. And this uh, feeling of myself of myself being the expert who is actually delivering the information uh, is very unusual because no one ever considered that this kind of information will be needed uh, in the 20th, 21st century. Uh, so uh, taking this, this perspective, um, we discussed during the Congress that there is no borders for radiation sa safety and this safety should be improved uh, and the discussions uh, should start from now and they should be ongoing. Uh, how should the community react uh, to this kind of terrorism? Uh, what measures could be taken uh, to protect the population and protect other countries against um, this terrorism? Because again, uh, international community have no means uh, for answering uh, the nuclear chantage and nuclear blackmail, uh, because there is just no organizations uh, who have the mandate to tell something to Russia, and they have no powers. Uh, for example, EAA uh, can give some advices to Russia, and uh, it can give some propositions, but any proposition uh, that is given by the EAA should be discussed in the national parliament uh, of the country, and then if the national parliament, parliament will adopt uh, this proposition, it will become a law um, and then uh, the country should obey it. But if the country is a terrorist itself, what should we do with this? Uh, so uh, making my notice quite short, uh, I need to say that um, Right now, we are on the verge, we are on the very beginning of the brand new era where we will have to reshape uh, the approach to radiation safety. We will have to consider all possible scenarios uh, for uh, kidnapping the whole nuclear power plant, like the situation with Zaporizhia, where Zaporizhia was basically stolen from Ukraine, uh, and it is uh, unprecedented, and it is very difficult, you know, to understand and to realize how can you steal the huge nuclear power plant, yet it happened. Uh, we need to consider the situation when the nuclear power plant, a very complicated technological object, uh, became a military base. So it is almost impossible uh, to take it back using military, uh, like using conventional weapons, uh, because you cannot use artillery, you basically cannot use uh, any infantry, nothing, because it is the power plant is operational uh, and it is very gentle so you should be very careful with non interrupting in the uh, interrupting the process uh, of operating the nuclear power uh, so it is opening i would say a new branch of science a huge branch of science about how should the community react uh, in case of this kind of blackmail uh, what should we what should we think? What should we do? Uh, and um, is it actually possible to use some kind of international um, uh, international infantry or internet international pressure uh, to actually stop the situation uh, from unraveling? And uh, for the end of my presentation, uh, I will give you a little bit of reassuring. I will give Ukrainians a little bit of reassuring. So Ukraine is basically the best place to survive uh, the uh, any kind of radiation accident because we have all of the expertise needed. Uh, basically, uh, we know quite a lot about what should be done uh, in case of radio and applied contamination of huge territories. We have a huge exper experience of managing the Chernobyl exclusion zone, and we have uh, a whole toolbox, uh, a whole inventory uh, of 
any measures that should be taken uh, to uh, clean up um, the radio and applied contaminated territory. Uh, we've been talking with colleagues about what can be done uh, in case uh, the uh, explosion on the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant and in case uh, the huge territories of Ukraine, the most fertile territories, which is Zaporizhia Oblast and Kherson Oblast, might be contaminated. And it is actually, uh, well, it is possible to clean them up and then just use it again um, as... Uh, as we used to use it, probably we won't grow uh, the wheat anymore on those territories yet. We can grow rapeseed or uh, sunflower, we can extract oil, the oil won't be radioactive, so it is actually too possible to use it. Um, and again, um, due to uh, the nuclear program of the Soviet Union, uh, quite a lot of radiation scientists uh, are Ukrainians and they came back after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they came back to Ukraine. So now we have a lot of expertise. Um, and uh, uh, it can be a sad joke, uh, but right now Ukraine is probably one of the most experienced countries in terms of radiation safety, because we know uh, we have the uranium mining, we know how to mine uranium, uh, we have Chernobyl, we have we know how to decontaminate the territory after uh, the large scale accident. Um, we have Klivash object uh, which contaminated the groundwater in Donetsk. Uh, so right now we will have the expertise on decontaminating uh, the groundwater after we will take back Donetsk and after uh, Ukraine's victory in this war. And then again, we have the experience of nuclear terrorism, uh, taken, uh, thinking about Chernobyl uh, that was taken by Russian troops, thinking about the Parisia uh, that is taken by Russian troops. So we will have all of this experience, we will have all of this expertise. And uh, again, uh, Ukraine is showing and will be showing the great resilience uh, when we can actually convert uh, all of the traumatic experience uh, into some knowledge and Ukraine will be happy to share it with the global community. So thank you very much for your attention. And if someone has questions, I will be really happy to answer. Thank you, Olena. Um, we will save our questions for the end. So, Elizaveta, you will be the first to, to go. Um, I want to now turn the floor to Dr. Simon Miles. Thanks so much. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, much as I regret the circumstances which makes uh, this, this relevant. Uh, as, as a friend of mine uh, became fond of saying uh, over the course of this year, um, if Simon Miles is relevant, then something bad is happening in the world. Uh, and tragically, that's the case now. Uh, here in the United States, uh, of course, there's great preoccupation with uh, facilitating Ukraine's victory in this war, uh, but also certainly in the military analysis circles in which I uh, move, we are sort of in what I would call a 1973 moment. Uh, 1973 moment being a reference actually to when watching the Yom Kippur War between Israel um, and several of its Arab neighbors basically caused the United States military to totally rethink its military doctrine. Uh, about how it would fight a war against the Soviet Union in Europe uh, based on learning done by a fairly small group of individuals who spent a whole lot of time uh, in Israel in the immediate aftermath uh, of that war. And I think that as we see uh, Ukraine's successes on the battlefield, just as much as we see uh, Russia's failings and are better able to understand the root causes of the failings of the Russian military, uh, we are starting to take, I think, some valuable lessons in the in the same way as, as the, the two other panelists did for where we go from here. Um, and we've seen, I think it's fair to say, uh, enough to take some big important uh, important ideas. And the first of these is, of course, painfully obvious, I'm sure, to most of the other people on this call, 
uh, but has been something that most of the American public hasn't really understood in the last 20 years of the United States' global war on terror, uh, and that is that war is still hell, and modern warfare is not always as modern as people think. Uh, and here, I think in the United States, the U.S. government, and in particular the U.S. military, um, have been almost in cahoots to promote a specific, very clean vision of what modern war, future war means, which is in many ways a recruiting and funding ploy, uh, but basically presenting an image of what warfare in 2020 and beyond looks like is a tandem between the long-haired cyber warrior who is well in the rear in safety, working out of some you know, nondescript Northern Virginia office complex, and then the long-bearded special operator working deep in the enemy's rear. And I think what we've seen in the case of not just Ukraine's war, but also in places like Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, is that that doesn't really obtain. And that the very clean vision of the future of warfare, which governments and militaries have been uh, promoting, has not been entirely accurate. And I think that not only has that been a problem in the United States, uh, which is actually a really prone to faddish obsessions with revolutions and military affairs. But also here, I think the Russian military learned some very wrong lessons from the American invasion of Iraq in 2003 and to a lesser extent, 1991, uh, and the NATO intervention in Yugoslavia and Kosovo in the 1990s, where a Russian narrative that American and NATO precision strike capabilities paralyzed Serbian and Iraqi forces in a way that basically made a ground assault either unnecessary or an afterthought came to dominate how the Russians think about offensive warfare. Uh, we now know actually that this was not at all the case in both the, uh, the logic, such as we can call it that, of Saddam Hussein and Slobodan Milosevic, who were only really primarily deterred by the threat of major ground invasions. And of course, that is what um, Hussein would be on the re receiving end of in the early months of 2003. So this fixation on, on, on a cleaner version of modern warfare uh, certainly hasn't served the Russian military well in Ukraine, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, nor has it uh, served, I think, the American military and other NATO countries um, where they engaged in a little bit, I think it's fair to say, of wishful thinking. The second big lesson that I'm taking away from events right now are that Prejudice, uh, groupthink, and deep ingrained bias hamstring militaries from top to bottom. Uh, I think this is really important to talk about in the American context, where a lot of people, uh, many of whom should know better, uh, are talking a lot about the introduction of so-called critical race theory and inclusion efforts in the United States military. Uh, perhaps people are familiar with uh, the quite uh, embarrassing episode uh, in which Senator, the senator from Texas, Ted Cruz, uh, posted a Russian military recruitment advertisement uh, and commented about how much more uh, manly uh, these individuals seem to be than the U.S. military, um, which doesn't look so great in hindsight given what's actually happening on the battlefield. But I think it's pretty clear that this was a war plan by probably only a few dozen people, uh, all of whom with very limited military experience and an enormous amount of prejudice, uh, a real fixation on uh, caricatures of Ukraine and the Ukrainian state, which translated directly into their military's concept of operations and fed directly into the poor performance that we have seen basically consistently throughout this war. Um, autocracies like Russia tend to be very bad at intelligence. 
and very much uh, privilege those who tell bosses what they want to hear. Uh, in this case, I think the FSB and others responsible for intelligence collection in Ukraine definitely overstated uh, the key factors that they thought would be in their favor in the event uh, of an invasion. Uh, autocrats are really bad at intelligence analysis. And, you know, even just earlier today when we saw um, the commander of the Russian effort, uh, Surovikin, uh, deliver his sort of brief to the defense minister, Shoigu. Uh, it was full of all of this kind of praise, um, half-truths, and outright lies. Uh, you know, it was very telling uh, that he basically stood up there and said, uh, we are winning and we are repelling the Ukrainians and we are retreating, uh, which is, of course, nonsense, but is a hallmark of military culture, I think, in Russia and political culture in Russia and in similar uh, countries. The, the delusional rants by Vladimir Putin uh, about Ukraine's non-statehood, little Russians, etc., belied a dangerous contempt for the enemy, which has never really served an invader well. The third big point to me is that military culture matters. Uh, and of course, a huge part of this is that Militaries with a healthy professional culture don't commit the types of war crimes that we've seen on the part of the Russian invaders thus far in the war. Uh, but also militaries with a healthy professional ethic tend to be good at adaptation to new realities, which the Russians have not been, uh, as they have struggled uh, in the, the recent months uh, and certainly weeks of their, of their invasion. Uh, and here, the hallmark to me of the military success of countries, including but not limited the United, to the United States and of Ukraine right now, has been empowering junior leaders, the technical and tactical ex experts who are right there where the decisive moments happen, giving them the power to actually do what they need to do, either to exploit an opportunity or to resolve a problem. When we saw so many Russian general officers going very far forward, especially early in the early phases of the war uh, and finding themselves on the receiving end of Ukrainian artillery strikes, we saw the consequences of a rigidly hierarchical culture which reflects in many ways political culture more broadly uh, in which that military operates, but also one in which people who really shouldn't be bothered with some of these levels of problems are not only having to go forward and try to untie these Gordian knots of logistics, uh, and, but also are putting themselves in harm's way. Furthermore, uh, that sort of prejudice-driven concept of operations saw Russia's most elite infantry units, its naval infantry, reconnaissance, special operations, uh, and airborne forces engaging in really onanistic light unsupported incursions into Ukrainian cities uh, in which they were getting slaughtered. Uh, we know, uh, the United States knows from hard fought battles in Iraq and elsewhere, that urban warfare is a combined arms undertaking. Uh, and it is hard. It is not a job for unsupported light infantry. Uh, and as such, over those first three weeks, uh, I think the most competent fighting force that the Russians had to bring to bear uh, died in, in Ukraine with really very little uh, to show for, their, show for their efforts. The fourth big point, I think, is that industry stockpiles and logistics matter. Uh, we're all probably familiar with how shockingly bad the Russian military's logistical effort was uh, early on in the war, which is quite frankly embarrassing as they share a land border with the country that they were uh, attempting to invade. Uh, it was best when they were able to use rail networks in the south, and it was worst where they were reliant on wheeled vehicles on roads in the north. But this is about much more than just that kind of what in the business sense is called sort of final mile uh, logistics. That is to say, uh, you know, getting equipment to its ultimate end users. Uh, and here, what we're seeing is really the critical role of the supply chain, domestic production and procurement, then forward stockpiling, and then getting it to the end user. And here we've seen uh, through the many Russian precision guided munitions that have failed, uh, and they fail at, uh, at 
you know, really shocking rates, uh, shockingly high rates, how much of their defense base is built on exterior, externally purchased components, whether that's in cruise missiles or whether that's in the most common unmanned combat aerial vehicle, the Orlan 10, um, and thus extremely susceptible to sanctions. But in keeping with the first comment that I made about the not so modernity of modern warfare, stockpiles of even the most basic weapons like unguided tube artillery rounds still matter a great deal. And as the United States is learning the hard way right now, once you shut down these production lines, you can't just restart them because you decide you have a need again. And so it will be costing the US government over a billion dollars to get the production programs for Javelin and Stinger uh, man portable missile systems back up and running. Uh, you expend in days or even hours what it takes years and years and years to produce. This will be an acute problem, uh, I think, for the United States as it thinks not just about Europe, but also about Asia and how much stockpile needs to be forward positioned. Meanwhile, uh, the Russians have not only dealt with problems in the form of uh, the difficulty of moving gear, uh, but also the gear themselves. And here the maintenance problems are also quite glaring. Uh, an important reminder of the essential role of maintenance and military preparedness. Uh, the Russian sort of vehicular fleet is based on a huge range of chassis uh, and as such is a maintenance nightmare because there aren't common parts. Um, airlines like, you know, um, you know, Ryanair only flies Boeing 737s, Wizz Air only flies Airbus A320s, EasyJet only flies Airbus A320s, so that all of their maintenance people and all of their pilots can work on the same vehicles. There's no sort of uh, gaps. And that is not the case that in the Russian military, which is a real kaleidoscope uh, of platforms, many of them very old and, and outdated. The fifth big point I think is important to note is that you go to war with the force that you have, and so you might as well make it sure that it's the one that you need. Uh, and while it is true, the axiom that plans rarely survive first contact with the enemy, there are strategic choices that you can make a lot earlier than encountering an enemy in what's often called the man train equip phase, which certainly improve your odds. And a lot of the most significant problems being experienced by the Russian military are the result of conscious choices and trade-offs that have to do with manpower. Uh, we've seen the undermanning of Russian units that has had pretty disastrous consequences for their efforts on the battlefield. Uh, but this was an army that was built to go to war in a time of mass mobilization. And starving it of the most important military resource, manpower, uh, has made it unsurprisingly a cripplingly weak military. Uh, we've seen formations entering the battlefield at levels of manning, which according to Russian doctrine themselves, would classify those units as, quote unquote, disorganized. That is to say, not fit for combat. Uh, and that was what they went in, you know, on day one. Uh, of course, the consequences of combat had uh, a really devastating effect on that. This current mobilization shift uh, is doing some benefit to the Russian military to, uh, to sort of stop the bleeding, so to speak, from a manpower uh, point of view. But it really remains to be seen whether throwing large numbers of poorly equipped, poorly trained, and unmotivated troops at this problem is going to be enough to really change events on the battlefield. The sixth big lesson for me is that your first away game is probably not the time to throw out your playbook. Russia's is an artillery armor, army. It's built on uh, the extensive use of fires in order to prepare the battlefield. Uh, and that is not how the invasion began. Uh, certainly not on the scale that Russian doctrine would dictate. And here, I think we have to look again to the assumptions that were being made in the Kremlin about how this war would play out. Uh, that doing warfare the Russian way would actually make the intended outcome, which was occupation, uh, much more difficult. And as such, the military had spent years and years training to fight one way, 
and was being told really at the last minute not to. And then when you do decide to rewrite the playbook, everyone wants a piece of the action. Um, and much like, for example, the American invasion of Panama some three decades ago, every piece of the Russian armed forces wanted to do their thing uh, at the beginning. This is also a hallmark of autocratic systems, which meant that you had, for example, uh, unsupported Helleborn assaults at the Antonov airfield, Hostomel airfield, uh, which very predictably failed. Uh, there was also, it seems, uh, in the offing, an amphibious assault that was going to land somewhere around Odessa, which would also have been uh, unsupported and also probably been devastating. Um, but of course, early failures then led to a reversion to type to include, uh, you know, the brutal shelling uh, of cities first on the front line, uh, and then the current campaign of terror bombing uh, deep in the Ukrainian rear. The seventh point I want to make is one focused primarily on intelligence, and that is that we need to really think twice about betting on fifth columns. And this was a classic mistake of the American invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, a heavy dependent, dependence, for example, on a man named Ahmad Chalabi uh, in Iraq, who was, uh, to put it very mildly, not as helpful to the United States as he gave, as he led American policymakers to believe as they delivered him truckloads of cash. Uh, but here we see one of the hallmarks of strategy. And that is that efforts to, for example, cultivate out friendly elements in a foreign society can be ultimately entirely undone by an assault that has a unifying effect on an opposing society. In other words, that people were perhaps quite happy to take large amounts of Russian cash and tell FSB officers, SVR officers, GRU officers, what have you, exactly what they wanted to hear, but when push came to literal shove, uh, weren't willing to go through on what they hope, what they had promised to do. And here I think we see Vladimir Putin's really strange obsession with uh, so-called color revolutions, which is a very cynic one, cynical one about civil society uh, playing its way out uh, in how they try to uh, lay the groundwork for invading Ukraine. The last two points I'll make very briefly. Uh, the penultimate one, and this is what uh, my colleague who spoke first said, uh, deterrence still works, right? The Russians are fighting a two front war of attrition, one against the Ukrainian military. That's the primary line of effort. That's not going very well, as we all know. Uh, and another against the West's willingness to continue to supply Ukraine's military uh, with the types of advanced high-tech weapons which are proving decisive in addition to their skillful use, of course, by Ukrainian operators in the field in this fight. Um, they are able to basically do this because of their nuclear deterrence. Uh, and I share my colleagues' skepticism uh, about the likelihood of, or even, frankly, the utility of Russian nuclear use in Ukraine. But in part, Russia has enjoyed, especially early on, more freedom of choice in this war because I believe the United States government and the Biden administration in particular have excessively self-deterred um, and, and, uh, and been too slow in many ways and too reticent in other ways uh, to provide the Ukrainian military with what it needs to, in order to bring about as expedient a, diff, a, a victory as possible. And then the final point I'll make uh, is that none of this should mean that anyone, whether that's in Washington or Brussels uh, at, uh, or in Mont at NATO head military headquarters, should sort of get cocky. Uh, and I now spend a lot of my time actually in American military circles and discouraging people from Russia, writing the Russians off as a paper tiger. Uh, first and foremost, because they maintain this military capability. Secondly, because this is not uh, the type of war that their force was built. Their force was really built to fight a war against NATO. Uh, and finally, because on so many of the points that I've just raised, there's abundant evidence of American military failings there too. Whether that was the logistical catastrophe that was the early phases of the invasion of Iraq, uh, or the many mistakes that were made uh, in Afghanistan as well. And I I think that maybe the biggest lesson 
that we can take from the war thus far goes back to the classic writer on warfare, Karl von Clausewitz, which is that war is unpredictable uh, and you can do a lot to make your own luck. Uh, and with that, I'll turn the floor back over. Thank you, Dr. Miles. Um, excellent discussions um, from both of you, lots to think about. And I would like to first open the floor for each of you to maybe um, talk to one another. Both of you gave us some really, you know, optimistic views, but also um, some grounded realities uh, to, do, to, I guess, um, prepare for the worst and expect the best. So perhaps um, we could start with some of your questions to one another. Um, we also have a few questions from the audience, um, including one pending by Elizaveta, but um, maybe maybe Olena maybe would like to start. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I had a question from um, Arabian TV, uh, and they've been asking uh, about whether or not Ukraine is going to uh, restart the nuclear program. Of course, I said that we have no intention to restart the, the nuclear problem, program as we really want to be reliable uh, in the international partnership. But what do you think? uh maybe some other asian countries are also looking at ukraine and thinking about okay so they gave up the nuclear weapon and now they have the technology so maybe they will be restarting the nuclear program do you think this uh opinion um exists uh, i mean somewhere else beside arabic countries uh i think south korea is going to get a nuke they can do it in no time, right? I mean, if the South Korean government decided today that they wanted a nuclear weapon, they could have a nuclear weapon by Christmas. Uh, technologically, resource base, uh, they have that capability. Uh, and that actually might be enough for them. You know, the fact that, that it's very self-evident that, that their nuclear acquisition timeline is weeks, months, not years, decades. Um, despite the fact that, you know, they haven't been as noisy about it as, for example, the Iranians, uh, they have what they need to do this, both in terms of the fissile material and also the delivery, you know, the delivery platforms. Uh, so I think countries like uh, South Korea are looking at this event and, uh, and are thinking that, you know, this is, this might be something that's really um, actually quite valuable. What's really important, though, I think, is that Vladimir Putin also learned the same lesson. He learned that lesson from Muammar Gaddafi, who gave up his nuclear weapons and then, uh, you know, in the in the, in 2011, paid paid quite dearly um, for that. So, so I do think that there is going to be a shift towards nuclear proliferation personally um, in the uh, in the in the coming in the coming months. I don't know that that it's going to become decisive, but. The worst thing I think that the Biden administration can do right now is provide, put fuel on the fire of those who believe that having a nuclear weapon lets you do whatever you want. Uh, and I think that there have been some statements out of the White House that have been unwise uh, to that respect, in that respect, including the famous statement at a, at a you know, pol a partisan political fundraiser that this is the most dangerous time since the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s, uh, that I think are not helpful in, uh, in, in terms of what the, where the international trends, um, are going. Uh, but I'd actually like to ask you, Elena, if I may, um, you know, I am, I talk a lot about using nuclear weapons, but I don't talk a lot about the consequences. And, and for the record, you know, I share our colleagues' uh, extremely extreme skepticism um, that there, there's a use case. To me, there's not actually a sensible military use case here. Um, I, I just, I can't walk my way through all of those steps. And I think there's, you know, we can talk more about that later. I don't want, this could become a huge digression. Um, but the question that I actually had was about scale. 
Um, and, and one thing that we saw, you know, I think from the Cold War was that there were uh, limited facilities for protection and preservation. Uh, but there were going to be in the event of, uh, of a nuclear use scenario, a lot of people who were kind of just left to make the best of it. Um, and so that's why some countries like Switzerland, you know, went deep down the kind of uh, homeland defense uh, path. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about not just the existence of Ukrainian sort of mitigation capability, uh, but your assessment of the scale um, and, and hope and, and the, the ability to actually provide this, this uh, nationwide, especially when um, I think what we're really seeing here is a lot of our models of things like fallout are really bad. Uh, they're really old, uh, and they're based on on some questionable assumptions. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that sort of civil defense capability nationwide? Uh, well, actually, uh, our civil defense capability really increased recently. Uh, we have quite a lot of jokes about uh, our ministry for um, it's not a ministry, it's a department for disaster prevention, and they are testing uh, the signal on the phones, just like Japan has, you know, that your phone is off, uh, yet it will still receive this kind of announcement and you will be woken up and that, etc. So right now, uh, we have the application about the yet um, which means uh, it shows uh, that the air raid siren is on and you need to go to the shelter. So I can see the notification and then after like 15 or 20 minutes, I will receive the signal from this uh, de the defense department and all people are laughing about it. Uh, yet it's improving. I mean, we didn't have it uh, in the very beginning of, of the war. Right now we have it, well, poorly operating, but it is improving. So I'm quite sure that in future it will be perfect and it will wake everyone up at night. Uh, so the most critical point for us right now is the communication uh, because people are actually well prepared for the situation. Um, and uh, we are talking here in Ukraine, we are talking a lot about the fact that, well, nuclear, well, nuclear weapon is just another weapon. So uh, we've been experiencing the chemical weapon. Yeah, we've been. Ex uh, there are some evidences that you uh, Russia is using biological weapon on the battlefield already. So uh, all of those types of weapons are banned. Yet they are using them. Well, nuclear weapon probably they won't use the large scale uh, bombs. Well, probably they will use the tactical ones. And well, it's just another weapon. So if you survive, if you're not in the on the ground zero, if you survived uh, the explosion itself, uh, all right, then we know what to do. But the communication, uh, like from the city major uh, to the military mi military administration of each city, it works really perfectly as long as it uh, based on the uh, personal links. But when you need to com communicate with someone unusual, uh, that's where the problem lies. So um, after Putin started uh, treating in us with a nuclear weapon, this communication really improves, but it's done in Ukrainian way. So we are just uh, introducing people to each other. They are just, you know, having a coffee and having a chat, and then they know whom should they call. So uh what is this war showing uh for ukraine and a little bit for in my field like for the expert society is that all of the protocols that were de uh, designed uh during the 60 years after the second world war they are not working actually because they are too bureaucratic they're too heavy and well it's not working if you don't have any personal connections. So right now we are just building up those personal connections and I'm sure it will work. Uh, um, the most critical point, uh, I will share you just two, two, two of my experiences. For example, I had a lecture for um, one of the biggest mobile operators and we were discussing uh, how, should, how should they prepare their stuff uh, in case of the nuclear accident, uh, and how should they prefer the stuff uh, who will be repairing um, uh, repairing the, the mobile towers. 
So they are they should not stay in house for at least one day. Uh, they should go uh, immediately after the explosion because they need to repair everything. So the company itself is taking a really good care uh, about the uh, staff and the company is not relying to, to the government. Uh, it already prepared everything. It, al it already hired experts, including me, to provide trainings. And right now I know that in case if something would happen uh, in a couple of hours, uh, I will have uh, my mobile internet back because people will return back to working. And then uh, it is kind of growing from the bottom. It's not like government is dispens dispensing uh, the um, instructions about what should people do. It's people from the ground. They are gathering the instructions and then they are building this kind of tower and then they delivering to the government the information like we are here, we are ready. And in case something would happen, you can ask us and we will do our job. So, um, Answering your questions, uh, yeah, I think we are ready right now. No one wants to think about it. We just want to close our eyes and just hope that it will never happen. Yet, uh, we are getting ourselves ready and I'm, uh, I'm sure that in case something would happen, we will just, you know, take a deep breath, cry a little bit, uh, drink a little bit of red wine and just go on and clean everything up. Well, this is the essence of planning, right? Whether it's military planning or, or civil defense planning is you plan for high impact, but low probability events, including but not limited to uh, this one. I think everything that you said, uh, I just really want to mention, um, is I think such a, a powerful comment about why we're seeing such diversion, such radically better battlefield performance by the Ukrainian military. Right and 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 also problems by the by the Russians because of you know empowering people on the ground uh, and whether that is you know to to think about their own safety in the event of, of a catastrophe uh, or to exploit events uh, and opportunities as they as they take place on the tactical level on the battlefield um, this is hugely important and and it is a, an asset that the Russian system, the Russian military system at least, but also social system in many ways, uh, is not really able to leverage. Uh, and obviously one that you are in, 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 a, in a really amazing way. Thank you. It was unexpected also for us. Oh well, yeah. Um, yeah, it, and listening to both of you talk, it also uh, illuminates the importance of psychological protection of the population of society in preparing for such a kind of um, unthinkable event. You know, the the images that we've all grown up with of Hiroshima and Chernobyl uh, are still just so embedded into our subconscious um, on a nightmarish level that that we, at least I know, I as a non-expert, automatically go to those images when I see or hear any kind of, um, you know, leader, world leader, uh, discuss nuclear warfare as as a capable or as a as a real threat, because I'm from the generation of the end of the Cold War and post Cold War, I'm not normalized into a kind of uh, preparedness for for uh, you know going into a fallout shelter like that's what my grandparents did, not my parents. So. I think it's it's important um, also, Elena, to to give yourself a lot of credit in what you're doing for um, social and cultural uh, adaptations to the, the context of a war in helping people just to manage um, their trauma and psycho psychological readiness um, in, in adapting, you know, to all and any worst case scenarios. I think for the you know mass consciousness of, of society and, and of um, the culture of of a prepared society that doesn't normalize violence and war, um, finding that balance is a really tricky one. Um, without you know completely completely giving in to a kind of victimology of of warfare, keeping. Um, as you said, keeping some level of your everyday life together, having a glass of wine, we will move on. <laughs> it's a good 
um, approach, I think. So I want to open the floor to others here. I know Yelizaveta Kolorkovska had a question. Would you like to pose your question? I'm sorry, I just need to comment uh, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Elizabeth. So, like, uh, as Jessica said, uh, some of the very, uh, like, inspiring experiences for me is that when we are usually giving the lecture, people are usually terrified. So we are starting the lecture about the nuclear war and people are really terrified and they're really dense, like tense and and that's it. And then uh, together with my colleague, we are usually giving those lectures together. So we would say like, well, probably it will be a tactical bomb. So the radius of explosion will be like around two kilometers. And that will be uh, like the scale of the fallout will be like this. And so uh, the activity will decrease and blah, blah, blah. So uh, people are starting to smile. And when you are saying like, well, we will just clean up the houses, you know, just remove all of the dust from the streets and then we will move on. So all in all, people, people are really smiling because like, well, we can manage. So this sense of managing, given the power to people and given the tools for them, like it's not the end of it. It, it will be bad, but it's not the end of the world. So that is really important in like in understanding this kind of threat. So Elizabeth, I'm sorry. Elizabeth, are you still here with us? Maybe not. Uh, uh, anybody? No, she's, she's, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, there, there was just no possibility to turn on uh, the sound, but now it has it. I have it. And first of all, I would like to say thank you to all the lecturers for this uh, insightful conversation. And so basically my question to Dr. Olena Bernuk. So you talked, well, I'm from Ukraine, and you talked about uh, so the growing uh, societies and well, communities concerned about nukes uh, after the start of the full-scale invasion of Russia. And uh, what do you think should be, should there be, because I had uh, an experience and, uh, of talking to some Japanese students who, talk, who told me that um, they have some basic courses implemented to their school program, which are mandatory about uh, the way we should, like about the radi radiational safety and nuclear safety itself and how should one act in the case of some nuclear catastrophe or whatever. So do you think uh, this is something that should be implemented in Ukraine now? Would it implement it in what way? And should it be mandatory like starting from the school age or somewhere, because, after the 24th, I started see, seeing all these posts on socials about how one should act, what one should take when some nuclear risk happens. So what do you think how this should be organized on the educational level for just for like basic knowledge and for Ukrainians who are kind of out of the sphere and got it into it only because of the threats posed by Russia? Thank you. Uh, well, that's a really interesting question. and. I don't have a definite answer on that because also I'm collaborating with Japanese quite a lot because of, you know, radiation uh, and the consequences. So, um, in for example, uh, this civil defense uh, in Japan, uh, they're very much focused on the actions that should be done uh, in case of the earthquake and in case of tsunami. So I've heard a lot of stories uh, from sur survivors after Fukushima and after the uh, tsunami that actually it was school children, like uh, primary school kids who saved all of the family because they were not thinking about what should they do. They were just acting because uh, this knowledge was so deep inside them. So they, they like got the notification on their phones and then immediately they started moving moving to some high points, they were taking grandfather and grandmother and mom and dad with them. And uh, their like uh, older relatives, they were laughing and they were saying that probably it's not necessary. But you know, when the kid uh, insists, it's sometimes it's much easier just to follow, uh, not explaining why shouldn't you do that. So um, in case of the earthquakes, it is very important for Japan, yeah? But uh, they are now implementing this kind of anti-nuclear, anti-radiation training. 
uh, but the power plants are very much, they are much safer right now. And the possibility that they will have another kind of tsunami and another kind of uh, Fukushima is very low. So this time um, uh, is taken actually from kids. I mean, they could use this time at school for studying something more important than learning how to survive in the highly, uh, in case of the highly unlikely rain, uh, event occurrence. The same goes for Ukraine. So on the one hand, uh, we do have quite a lot of nuclear power plants that are safe and they are green and I'm uh, very pro-nuclear person. And then on the other hand, we have Russia. Uh, it's not going to, um, you know, uh, disseminate. Probably it will be our neighbor for ages and we will have to face uh, the situation and we will have to learn how to live in this situation. Um, so I'm pretty much sure uh, that our civil defense lessons should be better and we should stop learning how to throw the grenade. We should start uh, educating our kids about the shelters, about, you know, these uh, two walls rules and etc. But probably uh, explaining kids what should they do in case of the radioactive fallout will rise uh, the scare uh, in, in terms of like nuclear power plants. So we need first to explain kids why is the nuclear power, why is it is why it is so favorable? Why do we need nuclear power plants yet? Of course, in future we will move to alternative uh, energy sources, but right now we cannot afford, uh, you know, like banning all of the nuclear power plants. So I think that yes, after the war, our civil defense lessons will be much better and they need to be implemented from the very beginning, from the very first year of the school. But I don't think that uh, we need to teach our kids how should they survive in, you know, like in, in the case of radioactive fallout and what should, what should they do in radioactive desert, because it won't help in case it will happen, but it will raise the fear uh, amongst uh, all of the kids and all of the families. Any additional questions or comments? It's now half past the hour, so we are running out of time, but we do have one question in the chat. Um, this one is from Gilbert Carrasco. He asks, can you comment, Professor Miles, on Ukraine's joining NATO? So time's running out. So I, I will uh, <laughs> very quick, quickly um, say uh, the following three things. Uh, one, the decision that was made uh, in Budapest in 2008 uh, to sort of indicate that Georgia and Ukraine would become NATO members, but not give them a membership action plan and not really talk about specifics, which was made uh, as the product of a compromise between the American administration, the Bush administration, it was then the George W. Bush administration, and the German and the French uh, governments was, I think, uh, the worst of all possible worlds, um, in that it created a threat, a perceived threat in the eyes of, of the Russian leadership, but didn't give um, the, the sort of the targets of that threat, like Ukraine, um, the protections that they would need to counterbalance it. So I think that there was a very unfortunate uh, and unwise political choice uh, it made at the time. Uh, the second point I'll make is that uh, NATO is officially uh, a membership uh, open alliance. That is to say anyone can join. Uh, and obviously many countries have, have chosen to uh, or have, have, have tried to do so. Uh, in the in the years following the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and the the end of the sort of Soviet sphere of influence in in Eastern Europe, uh, and I think that that's important. Uh, that's a point of principle on which NATO leadership should stand, uh, and hopefully, um, American and other policymakers will be steadfast on that issue. Uh, and then the third point that I would make is when this war ends, um, and I think uh, it you know, it will end in Ukraine's favor. Uh, there will be a very big but very difficult political conversation that needs to play out in Ukraine proper about the future orientation of the country. 
knowing that, as my colleague just said, uh, the Russian Federation is not going anywhere. Um, it And certainly, if there is my assessment only, if there is leadership change in Russia, uh, it is not that, you know, the peace-loving liberals take over, right? Uh, it's, it's the Nikolai Patrushevs uh, and people of that ilk who who have even more power. And so I think the Ukrainian people, as well as government, will have a tough conversation on their hands. Uh, but I think at this point, Ukraine has a military with enormous quantities of NATO equipment uh, in its ranks as a result um, of, the cur of, of current events. Uh, and I think that uh, victorious Ukraine would be an enormous addition to the NATO alliance in the face of what I don't see as a vanishing threat emanating from the Kremlin. All right. Well, that is a, a very, um, I think, clear-eyed view um, that probably many here share. And I want to also um, offer up another question in the chat from Ross. Please comment on Western intelligence assessments regarding will of Ukrainians to fight in the course of the conflict. Um, that's uh, up for, for grabs if anybody wants to address that. I know that's hard to assess here um, since we're, I, we're not I don't think it's hard to assess at all. I mean, you just well, heard Elena from Western say, intelligence just heard Elena say in the event of nuclear use, we'll have a couple of glasses of wine and then get down to business. <laughs> I mean, yeah. how do you, like, how do yeah. you defeat that? You know, yeah. and, and I, I always tell a story um, when I was in Kiev in, in, uh, in very early 2016, I was standing in the Maidan with a friend of a friend whom I, uh, you know, whom I met up with. Um, who had been, you know, part of the Euromaidan Revolution of Dignity protests as a as a as a university student, and uh, we were standing in the Maidan, and she was kind of pointing out everything that happened, right? Where you know they were taking sniper fire later on, where they set up their, you know, the the history faculty at Taras Shevchenko University had their like, you know, fire in an oil drum that they like kept warm around and things like that. And, you know, I've, because I do a lot of work with the American military, mostly in special operations, um, I hear a lot of war stories uh, from, you know, from people uh, who have spent a lot of time at war in places like Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, you know, Horn of Africa, etc. Um, and none have ever affected me. It, these are from people who are very much in that business. Um, and none have ever affected me, much like hearing this woman talk about when she was a college student and what they dealt with uh, then. Not only the sense of cohesion and solidarity, um, but the sense of purpose uh, behind that. And uh, I, I, I've never been as affected by, by stories, uh, a story like that one, um, because, you know, she works in a museum now, right? Um, and that's her framework. Like, that's what she's coming from. Um, so, you know, all militaries have morale problems. Uh, that's not something that's ever going to go away um, because war is not a natural place for human beings to want to be. Um, but we've seen time and again that people who are committed in, to defending their homeland, as the Ukrainian people are, uh, and who have that resilience from earlier experiences, man, I wouldn't want to be on the other side of that. And you can see Russian formations calling up the Ukrainian surrender hotline uh, very sensibly uh, when they're abandoned by their commanders to their fates um, as, as, as indicative uh, of that. So, so I am not very concerned uh, about the will of the Ukrainian people to fight because, you know, we've watched it for eight months uh, and it's, you know, something from which all societies would do well to learn. Definitely. And at Fulbright, I can speak to the will of the Ukrainians to learn and to teach and research and exchange critical knowledge um, that we have exchanged today. Um, many of you, a few of you here actually are finalists or are alumni. So this is about you as well. 
And um, again, also, we will have more of these virtual lectures. We aim to hold them on Thursdays, um, November 17, 18. We will have a symposium open to the public. Um, all of you are invited. And the topic will be about uh, genocide. So we did have a panel about uh, qualifying atrocities that are occurring in Ukraine as genocide earlier this summer. That's on our YouTube channel. It's been recorded and posted. And this is our follow-up symposium to that discussion. And it will be co-hosted um, with a new center, Lemkin Center for the Study of Genocide at Munich uh, Free University in Germany and Hrek Holodomor Research Education Consortium in Canada. So please tune in for that and write to us with your ideas and we will host you in the future. So thank you to our amazing panelists today. Um, and all of you, please feel free to write to them directly or to us in our office and we will connect you. So thank you again and a round of applause. Slava Ukraina. Slava <laughs> and thank you. Absolutely. And a big heart to everybody out there conserving electricity who didn't turn their cameras on. <laughs> we see you anyway. All right. Bye-bye.